Good afternoon, everyone. Andy Jacob here with the Dotcom Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series. We have a very unique and interesting show today. You know, there's so many people throughout the world that really like to take the simple way out. There's so many people that look for simplicity when really there might not be simplicity that they're looking for. And and we have someone on the show today that is very unique because the more complex things are in his business, which happens to be law, the more complex the cases are, the more interesting it is to him. So we wanted to bring someone on the show that's diametrically opposed to everyone looking for the simple things and the simple way out. Alan Crone is the CEO of the Crone Law Firm, and he actually loves complex cases. And we thought it was just such a juxtaposition that we wanted to bring him on the show to talk about it. Alan, thank you so much for coming on the Dotcom Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. It's my pleasure. I'm uh, glad to be here. Alan, it's super great to have you on the show. It's really an honor. I mean, you have won so many awards. You have been in the law space for many, many years in the Memphis area. You have been before everyone. You've been basically in front of every court that you possibly can imagine. I can't even go through the listing. I can't go through all the awards that you've won. It's really remarkable. But let's start, Alan, before we talk about this love of complex cases, let's pull the lens back to 30,000 feet, Alan, if you don't mind, and tell us about the Crone Law Firm. Well, at the Crone Law Firm, we represent employees, executives, and entrepreneurs in legal matters that involve their ability to make money. And that has a lot of different, uh, takes a lot of different uh, shapes and a lot of different flavors. Uh, but I, the, the core of our business uh, are disputes between people and either their business partners or their employers, that sort of thing. It's very interesting, Alan, because, you know, obviously your firm also helps, you know, helps business owners achieve their dreams or, or what they do is that you represent people maybe that have been treated unfairly. And what you really do in your law firm after looking at it quite closely is you really draw upon this very deep well of compassion and experience. And you're a real master at really devising winning strategies and innovative tactics for your clients. And we want to talk about that momentarily, but let's talk about the types of companies that reach out to you, Alan, and, and the types of entrepreneurs that you're able to help. Well, we started uh, representing our clients who, you know, they left one job, maybe voluntarily, maybe not voluntarily, and then went and started their own business. And we helped them uh, start up their business. And from that, uh, I developed, I'm an entrepreneur. You know, I started my my firm and and I enjoy um, working with people and helping them build something rather than just picking up the pieces after a dispute. And the more proactive you can be, um, the less, you know, the less legal trouble you, you get into. So, you know, typically for us, uh, our sweet spot is uh, employee, uh, employers that have 25 uh, to 100 people, maybe a little more. Um, uh, you know, you get much bigger than that and you want a bigger law firm to be more of a full service law firm across the country. And that's not really what we do. And I also like to be able to deal with the people, um, you know, the, the people who are owning the business and running the business, as opposed to dealing with a, a corporate structure. It's just more of who I am. That makes all the sense in the world, Alan. And obviously, your, your client list is very impressive. You know, when we think of law and we think of law practices, you know, on one spectrum, you have the idea that you file a lawsuit and you fight it out in court. And on the other spectrum, maybe you have sort of, we negotiate uh, a settlement. So, so in regards to sort of your practice, you know, where does it fall in terms of how you approach these very complex issues? Which one of the different paradigms, you know, seem to work best or neither one of them works best? It's just depending on the case. Well, I used to say that we handcraft our cases. Uh, we're not an assembly line. We're not Ford. We're Rolls Royce. And what I mean by that is every case is different. And 
you know, there's some law firms that mass produce cases, they, they have a volume practice and that's fine. But we look like to look at each one and figure out, okay, how do we accomplish this mission? And the mission is to solve the problem. And whether that's a wrongful termination case, or I don't like my business partner anymore, or worse yet, my business partner doesn't like me anymore and trying to force me out, or I've got this supplier that uh, I have a, a, a conflict with. And so we try to figure out what's the straightest, straightest line between where you are now and the solution. And sometimes that's a legal solution. Sometimes it's a just a plain negotiating solution or business strategic solution. And so we try not to be a one trick pony where, you know, the old uh, adage, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So, you know, filing a lawsuit isn't the, always the first club out of our bag, but it's, uh, it's why I got into the law. So I, I, I certainly don't mind doing it. Um, but we want to solve people's problems, not just win their lawsuits. And often that's a multidisciplinary thing where we've got to bring in other professionals uh, to help them, uh, folks achieve their goals. That makes all the sense in the world, Alan. And you know, you know, you're very well known in the Memphis area and throughout the country for what you've been able to do at the law firm. And something that's very interesting to me as a fellow entrepreneur and for the other entrepreneurs watching this show is one thing that you've been able to do very well is is you've become well known. And one of the things that you're involved with, you have a lot of memberships. Your members, you're a member of very various organizations, you're involved with politics, you know, you're everywhere, anywhere anybody is in that area, you're there and they know who you are. So how important is it as an entrepreneur, and in this case, an entrepreneurial law firm CEO, to be involved and engaged in the community like you are? I think it's critical. If I could get back in a time machine and go visit my 20 year old self, I would go back and I'd probably tell them, tell myself a lot of things. But one odd thing I would tell them is it's there's three important things in business, and that's networking, networking, networking. And I, I when I I remember when I was 20, I thought that was hogwash. I thought that was just something they told you to do. How could that benefit you down the road? But it's the relationships that you make in business, in your community that that form those uh you know, business opportunities. And so I have just uh, forced myself in a di- trying to be in a disciplined way to get out of my office, to get my nose out of the law books and go see people and talk to people. And it's amazing. When I do that, that's when my business grows. And when I get away from that, that's when I look up and say, I, where is my next meal coming from? So uh, plus I enjoy it. I enjoy being involved in in my community, I enjoy being involved in bar associations and everything I'm a member of. I, I, I am not just putting it, joining just to write a check or to put it on my resume. It's something that I, in one respect, I have a lot of passion about. Well, you can tell just from looking at it that that's the way it works. I mean, it's worked so well for you. And the other part of your of your giving back. Alan, is this civic and community involvement. There are so many different community activities that you're involved with, so many boards of directors that you're you know, uh, on that it really is remarkable. How does someone like you with this burgeoning law practice also sort of support and have time for all of these other things that you do out in the community? Well, having a good team is, is the first part. Um, I, you know, I've got a, a tremendous team here at the, the, the law firm. I was joking with somebody uh, today at lunch that uh, I was in uh, at a conference in Houston last week, and then I was in a mediation um, um, yesterday. And uh, this was my first day back in the office in about a week, and uh, things are going along so well. I said, maybe I'll just get lost for, for two or three months. Uh, my business would probably do a lot better. Um, but if you've got good people, who know what they're doing, who are better at what they do than you are, um, you know, you're, you're going to have a great product for people and you train them and have systems and a great culture. Um, you know, I think that's one thing a lot of us entrepreneurs sometimes overlook is the importance of having a culture and it's got to start with the CEO. And so, um, you know, I try to model the behavior I want my folks to have. And um, uh, so, you know, 
so far it's working for me and working for the firm. And, and that's how I do it. Um, you know, my job is to, to be the ambassador for the, for the practice. And I can't do that sitting in my office always. So I've got to be out there and I got to know that the trains are running on time when I do. I love it, Alan. It makes all the sense in the world. It's a great entrepreneurial lesson for the entrepreneurs watching the show that when you come back, if everything's chugging along and doing well, you know, you've done your job as a great CEO or as a founder because not all the time is it the best thing to have the entrepreneur that needs to be there in order for the business to function. And what Alan's been able to do is not only replicate himself, but hire in top-notch talent, which leads me to my next question, Alan. You've been able to assemble such a great team. When you're interviewing someone to come on board at the Crone Law Firm, is there one single thing that you look at? Are you looking at honesty, integrity, background, experience, the way they sort of can work a room or the way they light up a room? What's the thing that really kind of gets you to know that they're going to fit into the Crone Law Firm? Well, the antsy to get in the game is competence. You've got to have demonstrated uh, competence. Uh, a lesson I've learned lately is I, I don't hire for potential. I hire for what someone has already done. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of people make. And that's a mistake that, that I've made over and over where I see somebody say, oh, this guy's got, or oh, this woman's got a lot of potential. Well, that takes a lot of energy to get that potential. So that's the first thing is I look for, for people who have accomplished. The second thing we do is I've got a video um, of our values uh, our value pillars. Uh, and uh, I show that value pillar uh, video to everybody. And I say, this is what you're going to be evaluated on. Is there something on this list that you, uh, that frightens you? And, you know, it's excellence and service, uh, reliability, transparency, and integrity. And we talk about those things. And I said, you know, they're all important. And we talk about each one, particularly reliability, and what that means is in, a, in a lawyer. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for somebody who um, has been there, done that, uh, that demonstrates competency, that shares our values, and that is, is humble and hungry and really, really wants to work here. Not just do a job or this job, but to do this job here at the Crone Law Firm. And you've got to convince me that that's what you want to do, not that you just want a, a job. So uh, we hire slow, but we've uh, found that when we do that and take all of those steps, we end up with people that just knock it out of the park. I love it, Alan. It makes all the sense in the world. And for the entrepreneurs watching the show, when you're putting your team together, think about what Alan says. It's very sage advice. If you're always hiring for the person's potential, then you're going to spend so much time getting them to their potential. And oftentimes entrepreneurs don't have the ability to do that. So in Alan's case, you know, they have to be competent to start with. And then he broadens out the scope of how he hires. And that makes all the sense in the world. Now, Alan, you know, we started this show by talking about you enjoying the complex case. Mm -hmm. What is it about the complexity of law that really sort of gets you excited and gets you waking up in the morning? Well, I'll say this. Everybody thinks their case is complex. Everybody does. And on one level, Every case is complex, but I, I enjoy the, the, the putting the puzzle together and figuring out how to best, uh, if it's a piece of litigation that I know is going to go to trial or I think is going to go deep into trial, all right, what does that trial look like? And uh, how am I going to get us there? Where is the evidence supposed to be? How do the different things fit uh, together? And I've always, one of my, the God-given talents that I have, I can't, I, I didn't create it. I can't uh, claim credit for it, but I can certainly use it, is an ability to see relationships that oftentimes other people don't see. And so I enjoy solving those problems and then implementing it uh, to, again, achieve a mission. And, you know, there, there are a lot of personality types, particularly lawyers who, you know, they want to try the case because they want to prove that they're the smartest person in the room. Well, I'll try the case. Um, but only if that's the way to achieve the, the, the mission. And sometimes, you know, if you want to settle a case, the best way is to prepare it for trial. 
That makes all the sense in the world. It's really a great approach. It served you so well and throughout, you know, all of your clients throughout the years. So, Alan, you know, entrepreneurs are watching the show and maybe they're in a startup, maybe they're a few years down the road, and maybe they have not been involved with any type of litigation as of yet. Let's hope they haven't. And, and maybe they haven't been involved with any complex litigation. So when you have an entrepreneur or a business owner coming to you and they're faced with some litigation, do you also have to play as an attorney sort of a, almost a psychologist, because I would imagine some entrepreneurs, they kind of get freaked out, like, they, you know, they get hit with a lawsuit or something happens in their business that they weren't expecting, they, they weren't planning for, and now they have to hire an attorney to represent them. How do you deal with these entrepreneurs that come to you with, whether it's simple case or a complex case, how do you sort of work with their psyche? Is there, is there a trick or something that you do to help them get through? Well, I don't know that there's a, a trick necessarily, but the first thing I try to do is to get them thinking like business, like a business person, not about somebody, not like somebody who's just been sued. Um, and it depends on the kind of lawsuit, you know, but I mean, let's say someone uh, sues you for wrongful termination. Well, inherent in that, somebody's probably said you're a sexist or you're racist or you're, you know, you're unfair or whatever. And it's a personal uh, attack. And, and so I always say part of my job is to say, look, this is a business decision and you've got to slow this down and look at it in terms of the Benjamins. What makes sense from a business standpoint, what makes sense, uh, what doesn't make sense because you're thinking um, emotionally. And so I try to be that business voice from the very, very beginning, getting my clients to look at this as a business problem, not as an emotional problem. And, and that helps quite a bit. Um, and then the, the next thing I, I do, you know, take a breath. Nothing is going to happen overnight. You know, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the American legal system is the best in the world, but it's very, very slow. So what that means is, you know, nobody's going to be blowing three pitches by you at, not, at 100 miles an hour. These are going to come in like, you know, softballs. And that doesn't mean it's not going to be hard, but you can see this coming at you and we can make a plan. And I think if and then the third thing I do is I develop a plan and I say, okay, here's your roadmap. Here's what's going to happen approximately when it's going to happen. And here's how you're going to uh, respond to it. And here's how we're ultimately going to get to the end of the, of the road. And I think my clients really appreciate that part of it because um, it's like anything else. If you, you know, I don't know how to put a plum, I don't know how to fix a, uh, my plumbing. I hire somebody in to do that. I don't know how long they're going to be there, but I have one a plumber who came to my house and he said, okay, now, uh, Mr. Crone, here's what we're going to do. And he, he, you know, led me through it. He says, it's going to take me about two and a half hours and here's what it's going to cost. And I was able to go in the other room. I let him do his deal. Two and a half hours later, my faucet worked again. So I try to bring that into, into my, my business. And uh, uh, I, I've come to realize that my biggest competitor is no other law firm. My biggest competitor is, is Amazon um, because that's the level of service. You know, I got a, a, um, uh, an email. I got a package the other day and I got an email with a picture of my package on my, my porch. And I called a lot of my folks together and I said, this is, this is what we're up against. This is what people expect. So you've got to give them information because everybody else is giving them information. That may be a longer answer than you wanted, but uh, that's how I deal with it. I love it, Alan. I'm, I mean, it makes all the sense in the world. I mean, you're really giving a, a short, you know, Harvard MBA class right now with regard to the roadmap for your clients. It makes all the sense in the world for entrepreneurs watching the show. I'm sure they can relate to that because there is a roadmap that's necessary to take your company from A to B. There's also a roadmap in the legal process, and there's a roadmap for helping your clients. And what you talk about Amazon, you know, I've never really heard it said like that. And that's very interesting. And obviously, for the people watching the show, Alan's not talking that he's competing against Amazon, where they're going to go into the law practice. He's basically saying they have three buttons, you press two, and now they're down to one button, and the item shows up on your porch and you get a picture and, you know, it's seamless. And I think what Alan is saying is that 
you know, the, the biggest competition for entrepreneurs oftentimes is themselves and for their companies to keep on improving and to get better every single day, which Alan, you've been able to do throughout the years with your law firm. So it's really, really remarkable. You know, I want to turn the conversation, Alan, if you don't mind, to entrepreneurship a little bit. Sure. Because, you know, people think of law firms and they think of attorneys and, and, and maybe the first thing that comes to mind is not entrepreneurship, but certainly there's a lot of entrepreneurship in running a law firm and running a successful practice like you've been able to build, uh, you know, at the, Cro at the Crone Law Firm. So obviously, as an attorney, you probably building the law firm have come up across some obstacles once in a while, or maybe you hit a load, a roadblock or maybe a pothole and entrepreneurs watching the show, especially younger ones, as you know, Alan, they re they hit potholes all the time. And sometimes when they're younger, they freak out a little bit. They don't know how to handle it. So maybe you could give some advice on entrepreneurship about what a, an entrepreneur should do, especially younger ones who haven't experienced it as of yet, how to get through the roadblocks, how to get around the potholes, what they need to do in terms of a mindset to keep on going forward. Well, I, I think that, and I'm going to say all of this and realize that experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. And I got a lot of experience. And so I don't say this because I've never, I've never had these problems. I've had these problems and these are my solutions to them. I don't want people to think that I'm saying I, I, uh, I got all the answers, but I, I, it's a great question. And here's my response. I think the biggest word, if you're a young entrepreneur or starting out, even if you're 70 and you're starting a business, God I love you. Put the word discipline up somewhere. It's all about discipline. Um, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Sounds pithy, but it's true. I mean, you, um, you want to grow your business. You want to be making a million dollars someday. You can't wait. You can't, it's not going to happen overnight. And you've got to work, plan your work and work your plan and do a little bit each day. At the beginning of the pandemic, uh, I forget who said this, but uh, said, you know, the, the teams that win the Iditarod, the, the uh, uh, dog sled competition, are the ones who pace themselves. That you do 20 miles a day. And if you do 20 miles in half a day, you stop because you've gotten your 20 miles. Do 20 miles the next day, may take you all day, may take you into the, into the night because of the conditions. But when you get that 20 miles, you stop. It's when you burn yourself out, when you try to do too much or too little, do the same amount each day, and you build each day on itself, you're going to eventually look up, you know, after a period of time and say, man, look how far I've, I've come. But if you're trying to get to your goal in one swoop, it just don't work that way. And I know I tried to do that. And um, so that's the, that's the biggest takeaway I would, I would have is be disciplined. And, um, you know, I, 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 I also do, uh, I'm also a, a minister, an ordained deacon in my church. I do some preaching and, um, I heard once somebody said, I've, I've stolen it for a couple of uh, sermons. Um, you know, don't lean on a shovel and pray for a hole. Um, you know, God will give you a hole, but you got to start shoveling. And it's the same thing in, um, in business. There's some people that got rich quick. God love them. But most of us uh, make our living day to day doing um, the hard work each day. And as long as you've got a good plan, You'll, you'll accomplish your goals. Um, so that's my biggest uh, takeaway is discipline. Alan, that's absolutely remarkable. And again, the people, you know, watching the show, you just got a gem. I mean, why go to Harvard University when you can listen to Alan for a few minutes? And that would have been another course on the, on the MBA path. You know, we look at all these events as Harvard MBA opportunities, Alan. In other words, when, when the young kids go to school, they're taught things in a classroom by a professor and they're trying to teach them case studies about entrepreneurship and how to move through entrepreneurship. But there's nothing like being on the ground. There's nothing like having your feet on the ground as an entrepreneur, learning it firsthand versus in a classroom. So for the people watching the show, you're getting it here first. Now, Alan, you know, 
I want to continue on this path with you. And I know we don't have a lot of time. I know you're helping so many people in the Memphis area and you've got very complex cases that you're simplifying for, of course, your, your clientele and, and uh, doing what you need to do, whether it's negotiating, going to trial and building world-class strategies that you become known for. But what, what I'd like to do, Alan, is, you know, let's think about younger people right now, because you have some very sage advice that you've learned not only as an attorney, but as a minister and, and through your entrepreneurial journey. And oftentimes, and we started the show like this, younger people think sometimes, not all of them, but some of them think that, you know, life is just should be easy. You know, nobody has to pay any dues. Everybody should be given, everything should be given to me. You know, I, I, I deserve everything in the world. I deserve what's coming to me. I don't need to work for it. You know, I don't need to even think about it. It just should happen. And if it's not going to happen, somebody's going to make it happen for me. And there's a lot of that kind of attitude going on. How would you address that? What would you say to a young person, you know, to maybe get them thinking in a different way about that scenario? Well, I would say this, that the great thing about this country without getting too schmaltzy about it, is that uh, you've got opportunity to be Bill Gates. You've got an opportunity to be Oprah Winfrey. You've got an opportunity to be Barack Obama uh, or any of those names. But you got to work. you got to work hard. And the two extremes are both wrong. One is this notion of, well, you know, someone got to where they are because someone – you know, the turtle on top of a post. He didn't get there by himself. Somebody put him up there. And then the other extreme of, well, you know, I, I, there's no opportunity for me. I can't get anything I want to get because there's a conspiracy against me. And I would say people don't care enough about you one way or the other. There's, there's nobody, unless your dad is Bill Gates, uh, and even he's not giving his kids very much money if you read about it. There's, there's nobody that's going to... Uh, uh, give you something just because you, you you were the best at what you do. And there's nobody really working against you, uh, uh, you know, except maybe your competition in a, in a business way to, um, to bring you down. So get in there, mix it up. You know, it's going to be hard. That's, but that's the fun of it. You know, if it were easy, um, you wouldn't appreciate it. It wouldn't be any fun. You just have all this money and, and not know what to do with it. So, um, Get in there every day, you know, wake up and say, man, I'm, 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 I'm so grateful to have these problems today. I'm going to solve these problems. I got these supply issues or this guy won't pay me or I can't motivate my people to, to do what they're supposed to do or, uh, you know, the, the mail is slow, whatever it is. All right. It's a pandemic. Okay. How am I going to make money off the pandemic? How am I going to overcome this obstacle? How am I going to overcome this pandemic? And you figure it out and you implement it and you kick, you know, you kick its behind. And that's part of the, uh, not only the money that you get, but the achievement that you get for helping to build it yourself. And then remember the other thing with the turtle is that there's no such thing as a self-made person. You know, even if, even if you have no employees, somebody still has to hand you the money. You still have to interact with other people. We're, we're created to be in society with one another. And so, again, going back to what we said about relationships and, and, and all of that, um, you just got to leverage all of that and, and work in all of that, and you'll get there. And, uh, and that the other thing, the last thing I'll say on that is don't think anybody is criticizing. N not nearly as many people pay attention to us as we think. And so be a, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. And if they do care, to heck with them. Because at least you're in the arena trying to get something done. So, you know, I, I think this is the best time in the history of the world um, to be an entrepreneur. There's so many tools, technological and otherwise, to, to, to start your own uh, business. I say just go out and, and do it and don't think there's any limits and don't think there's any handouts. I love it, Al. What great advice. I mean, certainly if you weren't an attorney, you'd be on the circuit changing <laughs> people's lives as a, as a spiritual uplifting person. You know, I'm going to use a word now 
that I've never used on one of the dot-com magazine entrepreneur spotlight series interviews ever before. And this is going to be first. The word is Memphian. You are a fifth generation Memphian, which is unbelievable. Of course, you're a voracious leader, uh, reader. I hear that you're a semi-avid golfer. I'm not sure what that means, but I think you like to get out on the course once in a while and obviously do some business on the course as well. So listen, you are really, really amazing. I love the way you've been able to take your law firm, become such a member of the community, and also have all of this wisdom and sage advice for, for people uh, that, that are coming up behind you, if you will, to, to help them make a big difference in the world. You're someone that likes to bring light into the world. And you're also someone, obviously, that loves to fix complex cases. And that's what you become known for. Now, I'm not saying people that don't have a simplified case can come to you either, because they're going to get the same great law you know, advice and practice that the people with the complex cases are going to get. But listen, you really are a beacon in Memphis. Everyone knows you. I'm, I'm just so delighted to have you on the show. It's been great. I love how you spoke to the young people. I love the way in which you gave a couple of small Harvard MBA classes along the way. Really excellent, Alan. Congratulations what you're doing in the political arena. Congratulations what you're doing with your law firm. Uh, obviously, we'll put some links below the interview for people to reach out to you. But if you want some straight talk and some great strategy, I'm talking to the man right here in the Memphis area. Is there other states right now that you practice in or is it primarily in your state right here? We uh, we have uh, either offices or attorneys licensed in uh, Mississippi, Arkansas, Tennessee, uh, Missouri and Kansas. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, you're, you're you've got it locked down. Reach out to Alan and his firm if you need any help. And certainly listen to those gems that Alan said a few more times. I actually can't wait to get off this interview and then listen to the interview again so I can incorporate some of those things. I mean, you had the turtle on top of the pole and there was some great stuff here. So, Alan, I want to thank you so much for, for cutting some time out of your busy day to come on the Entrepreneur Spotlight Series. It's been an absolute honor and delight and a real pleasure to have you on the show. Well, you're kind. I sure appreciate those nice words. And it was my pleasure. And uh, maybe maybe next time I'll have you on my podcast. 